Hello. Um, today we want to go over um, about standards, but also beyond the, the research and the um, standard evaluation, um, also the uh, strategies for how we get to use these standards. Once we get them, once we evaluate them and pick the right thing, how do we get families using them and, and help the patients and the clients to be the most successful? We will show a variety of products um, in our PowerPoint here today. Um, we are not affiliated with any um, manufacturers, so the, the examples here are just examples of our patients and different things that they've tried and done, um, and we're not receiving any compensation from anyone. Um, we do have a lot of pictures and videos in here, or not videos, we have pictures in here of a lot of our patients. Um, we have releases that, to use those pictures, but we ask that you don't reproduce these for use. Like um, I was introduced, I'm an OT, I uh, also have my ATP. I do a lot with patients with cerebral palsy. I also do a lot with kinesio taping, um, early intervention age range, visual impairments, communication devices, seating and positioning, and a variety of, of other assistive technologies. Hello, my name is Doug Nunn. I have uh, 12 years of experience with post-pediatric population. Um, been doing pediatrics for five plus years and uh, fortunate to get to work with Catherine closely through our EI program and then also do early childhood. Uh, have some experience working in the homes and uh, we're excited to uh, talk to you guys about the standards. All right, so we want to do a quick review of the literature. Um, <clears throat> the benefits of standing. So this was a, a slide used courtesy of uh, Missy Talley, uh, who we also work with. And you know, I think it's well documented that the, uh, the standards improve bone health, the respiration and digestion, relieves pressure, facilitates hip development, enhances circulation, um, eye contact and participation. Um, and I, I like to add to it that I think uh, strengthening, especially with the dynamic standard, you have options for strengthening the upper trunk and head control and upper extremity function. So first, Martinson and Himmelman, 2011. I just, there are a lot of nuggets of knowledge in this article, so I, I encourage you to download and digest. Um, I, I was really impressed with it. Um, some of the, the, the quotes was the extent to which parents and physiotherapists agree on the importance of standing and the value um, uh, parents place on the therapeutic goals for their child and determine how often parents will place their child in, in, in standing. So just remembering that we have to kind of uh, win our parents over to see the value of the standard. The, uh, the effects of the straddle weight bearing net at similar results uh, to surgery alone and therapy time should be simultaneous with free play time and not separate of it. Um, Jenny Paleg. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Jenny Paleg uh, with the Systematic Review 2013. She surveyed 687 study, uh, studies, 30 met the inclusion criteria and were included uh, in a systematic review, standing programs, uh, five days a week, have a positive effect on bone mineral density, hip stability, lower extremity range of motion, spasticity, and then again we have some information on the dosage, uh, 60 to 90 minutes uh, for bone mineral dis density, hip stability at 60 minutes, and we're now seeing more and more literature about the 30 to 60 degrees of total bilateral hip abduction. Range of motion at 45 to 60 degrees, spasticity management, 30 to 45 degrees, and it seems like we're leaning outside of that 30, going closer towards that 60 and beyond. Uh, also with the study, Kotlarski, Haber, Bielek, and Edelman, uh, they talk about the safe zone in the abduction range, so that we're not abducting individuals too far. So in one of the studies they had talked about making sure that there was no resistance in the, the adductor muscles. So taking them about as far as they go before you really feel them, uh, the, the adductors kicking in. Uh, Lauren Rosen had a great article here recently 
Uh, I thought it was a really nice summary of the benefits of standing with helpful references for educating our third party payers. This is an ongoing challenge with funding for the, the standing equipment. Um, again, uh, it was a great summary, something to, to look back on. Researchers uh, need to control for how much abduction is used to establish if there's a gold standard degree uh, of motion that's needed. But what she is still proposing is that we still do the hip abduction. Current research does not strongly support spasticity reduction for lessening hip subluxation. Uh, that goes with uh, SDR surgeries um, and uh, back and pumps. Uh, they, they affect spasticity, but not necessarily uh, lessen hip subluxation. Staining has been shown to decrease spasticity in children with CP. One study showed that if a child could take 10 steps unassisted by the age of 30 months, they had no risk of subluxation. So those are little mental markers that I love, uh, that I, you know, I want to include in this. And it seems like um, there, there does seem to be some inconsistency on using standards for individuals with significant hip abduction or dislocations that came out of uh, Lauren's article. Just stating that often physicians uh, will tell families that standing will only hurt them. So I, I think we still need to look into what we need to do in the case where we already have maybe that, that dislocation. Uh, it, are, are they still able to stay, stand and participate uh, pain-free? Then I think that's maybe the direction we, we might need to go, but we'll need more evidence. Masius and Merlot, Bagher, Caliphat, uh, Girabent, Fares, and Stuberg. Um, I have two articles uh, that I'm, I'm referencing here, but uh, at the age of five years, the migration percentage of the comparison group showed asymmetrical hip development with a range between 12% and 47%. That was the control. But children of the standing group were found to be more symmetrical with hip development with a ranging between 13 and 23%. So that seems very significant. Parents reported less scissoring of their children following the use of the standard, and this was encouraging for them. So again, just educating our families, letting them buy into the fact that this is a product that they need. Nobody goes to these equipment evaluations and they're fired up to get into a stand standard, especially a static standard. Um, they wanna see their kids move and walk. Uh, certainly we have good options with dynamic standards that are out there, but if the child's not appropriate, we need to uh, emphasize the, the value of the standard. Uh, the other article um, had mentioned that although standing devices seem to improve body functions and structure, they also promote participation in upright activities and allowing the child to be at eye level with peers. Uh, so the next slide is, you know, how are we implementing all of this? How are we arriving to the recommended you know, standard? How are we achieving hip abduction? How are we implementing a standing protocol? Sokotoa. This was uh, what I had shouted out when we were, um, uh, we had a presentation with, with Jenny Peleg and we were just trying to make sense of what, what next here with, with standing and abduction. And that was just the scab of knowledge that I remembered from high school. Um, but, so don't be afraid of the trigonometry, but if the angle X is unknown, then sine of X equals A over C or opposite over um, hypotenuse. So the, again, that would be the half the distance between the distal landmarks uh, over the inseam. So your inseam measurement would be um, the hypotenuse and the opposite angle, which is represented in uh, line A, would be um, half of the distance between the distal landmarks. And the reason why we're looking at that too is because there's relatively low uh, reliability of goniometric measurements per the research that was cited uh, and, and Masi's standing uh, program to help with flexibility. So we, we um, you know, in looking at what we can do with measuring hip abduction, we can use trigonometry, which, you know, uh, in theory should be able to decrease uh, inter-rater uh, reliability, and it'll be something that we'll have to maybe take a look at at another time, but 
Um, and I, I'm, uh, we had only kind of proposed this just based on there didn't seem like there was a great standard on how we're going to measure hip abduction in these standards. If, you're, if the gold standard is to um, use the fulcrum at an ASIS and um, do one leg down the central femur and the other at the ASIS, then um, we're, we're, we're going to have some trouble when we're doing prone standards. Uh, when we have all the positioning straps, we're not going to be able to feel for those boning landmarks. So this was just maybe an option for, for thinking about how we could do things a little bit differently. And a lot of these standards now are, are referencing where the mechanical components are. But um, so we have um, a couple um, examples. I think the, the, the main thing, we hear 60 degrees a lot. So uh, with, with the 60 degrees, we have uh, um, the 30, 60, 90 uh, theorem states that the um, hypotenuse, let me go back here a second. You see it? Yes, when seeking 60 degrees of abduction for children, the 30, 60, 90 triangle theorem states that the hypotenuse or inseam is twice as long as the opposite side, uh, the distance from distal uh, landmarks to, to midline. So you could, I, you could double that. So um, in theory, then you have uh, the hypotenuse, the inseam would be the distance between the bony landmarks to hit 60 degrees of abduction. And I think the main point on this, bringing it back to function, is when we have the kids in the standard, we want to see where, they, where they're at in abduction. We're trying to follow what we're finding in the evidence. Um, how do we get a, a quick measurement that we can maybe figure out what their angle is? Um, you know, without working around all the positioning parts, how can we set it up right before they get in it? Um, just a, a quick measurement that might be a little bit more reliable, something that we were kind of looking at. Am I using this correct? Okay, so I was trying to show like briefly um, 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 a, a slide here that, that gave some estimates for hip abduction uh, degrees that you could look at. So if you were doing the sine and cosine, um, you know, I had made a chart that just would correlate with, um, you know, if the inseam was measured in centimeters versus the distance between the boning landmarks and in this uh, slide I said the mid the midfoot, but it could be used in seating as well. You could do the inseam uh, to the knee and measure the, the distance between the knees uh, to help figure out like how much abduction maybe the hips are in. So moving away from, from that, but just talking about the standing dosage for kids, we have uh, from Sunny Hill, you know, uh, hopefully you all have seen these images, but um, you know, infants ages zero to two, what's being recommended with aiming for a little bit of that hip abduction, uh, using daily uh, to their tolerance, and introducing this at nine to 10 months of age. Again, at two and six years of age, uh, we we're still wanting that hip abduction, trying to limit the amount of hip flexion, uh, trying to get to, to zero degrees of extension and uh, aiming for 60 to 90 minutes a day. Going on with uh, age of six to skeletal maturity. And then uh, thinking, about fun thinking about function. Yeah, so kind of getting into some of the fun stuff. We, we have to base everything that we do off of evidence. We want that to guide us for best practice. But when we get out into the field and we're trying to work with a family on trying out standards, selecting a standard, working on how to use it, how to get the right standing protocol. We're following the evidence, but we need to make sure that we're getting the right fit. Outside of the evidence and the fit, there could be a lot of right answers that might work for a patient. Oftentimes, when it comes down to actually selecting and implementing it, it's in the details, it's in the nitty gritty things about their daily life that um, is what makes the best choice when there's more than one potential good option there. Um, we can do the best physical assessment and know all of the latest research, but at the end of the day, the best standard is the one that the, the client will use. 
So going into thinking about evaluation, um, looking at a standard evaluation and um, any assistive technology evaluation for that part, there's a lot of components we need to consider. Um, pulling it back to kind of a textbook model when I was in school, the HAT model um, from Cook and Polger uh, goes over the, the, the interrelatedness of the human, the assistive technology, and the activity or occupation. Um, this one really speaks to me as an OT because the activity and the occupation, the, the end application here, I think is something that we look at kind of briefly, but we don't always delve into it in as much depth as I think we need to be really successful with applying these standards. So breaking down that HAT model and kind of combining, combining here in this graphic multiple frameworks. So the human, assistive technology, and activity and occupation, those categories reference back to that HAT model that I just showed you guys. But on top of that, um, it all happens within the environment. Um, and under, in each of those categories, I have listed um, pieces that I'm pulling from, for me, the OT practice framework. Um, mirrors a lot of um, components of the ICF. So we're having to look under the human part of physical assessment, body structure, structures and functions, performance skills. In terms of assistive technology, I'm pulling things there from the Resna position paper on wheelchair provision and the assistive technology um, standards of practice from Resna. Um, activity and occupation, that goes back a lot for me to the practice framework like I was talking about. What activities are we doing? ADLs and IADLs we talk about a lot when we're trying to justify things for insurance with standards and wheelchairs. But thinking about rest and sleep, how will they use it at school and work? What kind of play activities might they want to do? How many of us actually ask a lot about the play activities that a child wants to do in a standard? We want to know ADLs because that helps us justify to insurance, but all of these habits, roles, routines, activities are really crucial for us to make sure that we can integrate the standard. So thinking about taking in that background and that needs assessment. Um, what's the reason for the referral? What is the outcome? So what, what is the patient coming in there and what's their goal? That's the first question I ask. So what brings you here today and why is this important to you? Um, what are their primary problems? Um, the, the responses here give you an idea of, you know, are they coming because the doctor told them to, that they need to have a standard? Um, what, are there certain functional goals? Are there major concerns there? So what is their goal and how invested are they? This is so important because we need to start off on the same foot and discuss, you know, if we're not having the same goals here, you know, we might know from the doctor that a referral is needed because there's concerns for HIP, but Oftentimes those things aren't translated and explained well um, in all cases to the, to the client. So making sure that we're starting off on the same foot, knowing what the goals of standing are and what the importance of it is and how we're going to apply it. Treatment strategies that they've previously used or, or equipment that they've previously used and what the outcomes were of that. And then of course all of the medical status and history. Talking about the environment and context is huge. Um, like, a, you know, we have up here, if, if you ask the right questions, you'll get the right answers. I think in an equipment evaluation, um, beyond the physical assessment, we need to be excellent interviewers. We need to know how to pull the information out that we really need to, to get, not just for our documentation, but for application of the standard. Um, so who's going to be getting the client in and out of the standard? Who is that patient going to want to interact with when they're in the standard? Is this going to be used at school and they're going to need to interact at peer level? Are they interacting with mostly adults? Are they interacting um, at home? Where is this, you know, like I said, is it something that they want to go outside? I have a lot of families that um, have great success integrating their standards and activities outside, especially now that it's spring and we're going to start to get warmer here. Um, it's a motivating environment for them to be at, at peer level. Um, talking about routines, if we don't know the routines and the demands on a client and their family and caregiver's time, how are we going to help them find a standard that they can tolerate and that they can tolerate for the recommended amount of time and the recommended dosage? So if there are a lot of demands on the standard uh, or on the time, you know, maybe it's especially important to make sure it's very quick and easy to get into. Um, maybe we need to know, okay, there are certain times of the day that this is going to work really well. Um, maybe those times are after dinner when everybody goes for walks. So I'm going to need to pick something that has a pretty decent caster. Lots of um, important information here. 
what equipment is currently being used, um, what works and does not work, what do they like, what do they want to do, how are they going to be transferred into the standard, how user friendly is it to get in and out and for the caregiver to use, um, how much growth do we have? We know when we're working with pediatric clients, um, growth is a major factor. So, you know, we want something that fits well and fits the function for right now, but that we're not going to be um, in light of some, you know, many of the funding challenges many of us face. I don't want to be coming back in a year from now and be battling to get a standard when maybe, you know, we could have compared some options that might have had more growth if needed. So we, we encourage multiple trials at our center. We're fortunate to have uh, many different options. And um, you know, we, 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 we like to see the children um, have that option to, to um, you know, look at a prone standard, look at a supine standard, if multi-standard is something that, that is um, um, what, what they need. But we, in doing the standard evaluation, you know, just looking at their an anatomical alignment, uh, their postural control, just doing the regular mat assessment. We want to um, know their skin integrity needs, um, their, their strength, the range of motion, uh, the tone. We have the responsibility to uh, determine the size products that are, are needed in a, um, Okay. So again, um, we're looking at their, their sensory processing, their cognition, their speech and language, behavior, other body systems like their cardiovascular, respiratory, digestive, uh, transferring method. Again, she hinted on, you know, who is going to be the caregiver that's getting them in and out of the, the, the products. Um, their current mobility skills based on, gym, you can use the GMFCS level to kind of have an understanding as to what type of product you might be leaning towards. And then the overall size of the individual, uh, the needs for growth, the size of the product itself. Um, okay. So going into kind of the next session, section of evaluation, getting back to activity, and what are they gonna be doing in the standard. Um, as an OT, my bread and butter is doing the occupational profile. Um, Doug knows how much I love doing a COPM, if any of you could do those. But looking really through um, all the different areas of occupation and what, we're, what are they doing. So um, in all those areas of occupation, some good questions that you might want to ask. What activities are preferred or what are the most motivating for the client? What things do they not prefer to do? Um, where are the biggest demands on their, on their time and daily routines? So where might... Knowing the demands, we can start thinking, where are we going to fit in standing? Um, and can we get the dosage that we need to? How can we help them achieve that? Um, who's going to participate in activities with the client? Um, siblings, parents, friends, schoolmates. Uh, are there any activities that they wish they could do, but maybe can't right now, or don't think so, think they can do? So I have a lot of families that think of Stander um, as maybe an, more of an indoor activity because not all of them have great um, wheels to be taking outside. Uh, but I have, a, I have a lot of families that have also been really creative, and some of our newer families that don't have that kind of frame set in their mind of this is an indoor activity, they take their standards outdoors, they figured out creative ways to make handles and push it around. So are there activities that they would want to be doing in a standard that maybe they're not thinking that they can do, and can we help them achieve that? Would that help us get the right dosage? Um, preferred environments, past equipment needs, um, What's their stamina? When, when do they need rest breaks throughout the day? When is the best time to achieve standing? So all those things help us get a lot of information about how to do, um, how to, to, to get a good occupational profile. Um, when we get into making the standard selection, uh, we are looking at kind of a summary of all these things we've gained through our evaluation of the physical assessment, the intake um, from the referral, the occupational profile. What's their age and size? What goals did we identify of the standing program? What positioning supports through our MAT assessment have we determined that they feel like they need? Um, based on size, what's the growth and what are anticipated needs? 
How easy are these different items that we're gonna compare to use for the family and the caregivers? What's the child's tolerance, um, the environment? So this is just kind of a summary of all those things, but these are the main, the, a lot of the main points that we're really um, comparing when we're trying to actually compare features and put children um, in standards and, and find the right fit for the client. Some features I like to look at when we start doing the trials, things like the foot to floor distance. So this is something that can really have a big impact on social interaction and their ability to participate in transfers. Um, you know, if, the, if it's really high up off the ground, um, but maybe there's a similar frame that's lower to the ground, and we know that this is gonna be important because they have multiple siblings at home that they're wanting to interact with, or this is something that's gonna be used at school. That might be a really important feature to compare when you're looking at the standard. Um, the frame size, how close can they get to the activities they wanna do? Um, if they love to um, get up to you know, the table and do an activity with, a, with peers, is this something that can get to that height? Um, can you get up to that water table that they want to play at? Can you um, get... A lot, our, a lot of our kids, a lot of our kids like to uh, move when they get into the standards, so just being able to uh, maneuver around the house or get out the, the, the door, so a lot of these families like to, to, to be creative with, with their standards. Again, with the, the foot to floor distance, I think uh, really helps with a lot of our kids have, uh, that might be in that multi-stander or the supine stander, they have poor head control and just trying to uh, in have that motivator that's up there, they want to look up there at mom and dad, they want to participate, they want to interact with their peers, so that's something that I feel really, uh, that is very important. And I think with the frame size and, and the distance and everything too, so to, you know, like I was saying, toys, water table, that dollhouse that they want to play at, that would be a great standing activity, but can they get close enough to actually reach it in light of the size of the frame? So those kind of things and knowing the activities can help us pick the standard that's going to allow them best to do the activities that they want to do. And if they're doing motivating activities, people are going to want to stand. The tray, the size, and whether it's removable um, is another thing that we want to look at. So um, for me in particular, I do a lot of work with patients with visual impairments and cortical visual impairment. Sometimes an opaque tray might be nice so that we're not seeing all the, the, the reflectiveness and the you know, clutter and the movement underneath from you know, different things. So uh, you know, is it angle adjustable? Does that help for vision? So the, those are for things for me with our population having a lot of visual impairments. I like to know how much adjustment I have in the tray and what the tray looks like. And I think that's also, I believe that's also important because with having a multidisciplinary approach, um, as a physical therapist, if I solely look at it through physical therapy lenses, I miss out on the potential um, you know, benefits of some of these other features when we're trying to look at vision and their, their play skills. You know, as a PT, I might be just really focusing on their, their overall positioning and what we can achieve. It's helpful to have the background uh, where I work so closely with, with speech and, and OT and just taking those things into consideration. Doug especially loves when I make sure we have a really big tray for things so I can get into all the messy play That's that right. he so desperately loves when we're in our groups. Um, but looking at some other features, so the tilt. Um, the angle of positioning impacts phys visual and physical access for play, learning, and socialization. Also the factors of ease for caregiver transfers. So certainly we know having somebody that need a client that maybe needs caregiver assistance get in a standard, the tilt is gonna be helpful. The, the ones that are able to get you at a, at a good height for transfers are helpful. But thinking about tilt, Douglas knows that I always come behind him if we have a patient that doesn't have great head control, our tendency is to, let's put them in a little bit of tilt so we can do that. And I'm always coming up behind them and putting them more upright. So um, when we're tilted back, that's not a great position for function all the time. It puts us in a little bit more of a resting position and while your head's up, how are you gonna use your arms? Um, for our patients with visual impairments, how, um, how much more does that, just few degrees of tilt, put them looking at the ceiling and the lights where light gazing much, might be much more prevalent. So those are things that I'm looking at in terms of function. Um, is it easy and quick to tilt? Can I get them more upright and give some extra supports to have their head upright when I wanna do a specific activity and then tilt them back for rest? Um, do they need to be in tilt all the time? And if so, then maybe I need to raise the height of the tray and the angle of the tray so they can see what they're doing. Um, lots of things there that really impact function. 
Um, how easy are the supports to adjust? So kids grow fast. Are they something that we want the caregivers to be adjusting or to be coming back for adjustments? How well have they been trained with some of those things? Um, and is it easy for us and is it easy for caregivers to, to make the, the quick adjustments that they might need to to a lateral or something like that? And I think an important note with that too is when you're doing the delivery of the product that uh, a lot of times you can set a child up but just making sure that you set that child up to where maybe that simple growth can be done by the family. So, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of uh, families that come from quite a distance and a lot of the therapists that might be in the other areas uh, may have less familiarity with the products that are recommended. So just making sure that uh, we have some simple growth that can be built into the products and, and empowering families and educating families so that they can make those small little adjustments uh, and, and recognize too when a child's growing out of clothes or when they're uh, changing shoe sizes that they, they, that they call and they schedule and, and, and have that looked at again. So we're just, again, looking at the types of standards you have um, and, and their codes. So we have a, um, a lot of GMFCS 3s, 4s, and 5s um, that are utilizing the, the, the products. Um, when we uh, when I talk about the categories of standards today, um, we will um, we'll be discussing it in terms of like their positioning support, uh, supports, uh, supine or prone, um, but this is uh, not how the, the equipment is, is built. So uh, we have the EO 638 static single position, which is uh, standing frame table system, one position, upright, supine or prone standard, any size including pediatric with or without wheels. We've listed some examples, not always uh, or not necessarily um, uh, uh, exclusive of other products that are out there, but um, you know these are great because they have just a small footprint design, can be easy to set a child up, but generally they offer a few positioning supports. Um, the Zing Supon standard there is offering a hip abduction and uh, recently to the R82 Meerkat seems to have a, a place in the market with uh, the, the dynamic component that it offers. We've seen some, some uh, children that respond to all of these different standards. Again, with position of child in prone, this might be something that is easier to do with a smaller child, but um, can become more labor intensive for the caregiver, which is uh, oftentimes why we might be looking at uh, a multi-stander. But the benefits of a static single position stander is the small size. They're a great option for gaining endurance with head and trunk control. Most standards position children close to the floor, uh, uh, close to the floor level to interact with their environment and their peers. Uh, there's less support, so there's more freedom for reaching and play, so it's less restrictive. And I know um, a colleague that had shared this picture with us, um, if you follow online on Instagram, Willow's CP Journey, they have lots of great pictures and lots of examples of how activities. she uses her stander and activities to do in the stander, um, in addition to other equipment, I believe, as well, but um, had some really great pictures and examples there. So the limitations are that a child may need, to, uh, may need help to transfer into the device. It only offers one position. Sometimes children feel stuck in one place. Um, there's limited positioning supports, limited ability to abduct the lower legs. Um, and we know now that, that the uh, abduction is something that we need to be considering. And um, it's just uh, limited with adjustments and ability for growth. So this, the EO 637, the sit to stand, is a combination sit to stand frame table system, any size, including pediatric with seat lift feature with or without wheels. Again, we have some examples, uh, the easy stand products, prime kid stand and prime symmetry youth. Um, these, these frames have a place for those children that have uh, knee flexion contractures or hip flexion, flexion contractures and we can still try to get them more upright uh, the research does support a prolonged static stretch, and um, they can be helpful because they, um, 
they're at, again, they're ideal for those with uh, range of motion limit uh, restrictions. They gradually um, help to uh, assist or improve one's tolerance to, to full elevation. Uh, they provide the prolonged stretch. They can sit in short bursts and then easily be raised back up in full elevation uh, to build endurance. And um, you're able to use a patient lift to transfer into the device. Limitations is the size of the device. So sometimes it's a, it's, it's a benefit and sometimes it's a, a limitation. Um, there's no abduction that's offered with the products. Um, again, feeling stuck uh, as with many of the different products. And then some devices position children high off the ground and have, have large frames, uh, which leads to limited interaction with peers. So we go to the multi-positional EO641, and it's a standing frame, table system, multi-position, three-way stander, any size, including pediatric with or without wheels. Um, we, we do like this, especially when we're trying to make recommendations to get our kids up at 10 months of age. Um, it's hard to project where these children are gonna be, and I know that we're, we're, we're getting closer to, to um, um, test and measures that might help predict outcomes for, for some families or for some children. But um, it, as said before, I think you, know, you might have an easier time getting a child into a, a prone position early on, uh, but as they get bigger and larger for the caregiver, need to switch that over to supine. Or you could have the case where the child is more dependent and uh, using supine and making some progression in, in their, their ability to require less supports and transition to a prone. So the, again, I've kind of stated already the, the benefits. There is um, uh, the ease with transfers, um, many positioning options, so a child would be less, less stuck. Uh, you could uh, essentially train uh, families so that they can make those adjustments so it could be activity specific. Um, and then many of these devices are now supporting 60 degrees of hip abduction, at least as measured mechanically. And then uh, the limitations with all of our standards, our size, it's always intimidating for families. I love getting um, kids before the age of two and I can introduce a standard to them um, but it gets much more challenging when they, they follow up for that next, next tier uh, standard. Um, the multi-positions still also can be stuck in one place. Um, it, it lacks the dynamic component. Um, this is where a lot of our families have gotten creative and ad made adaptations so that the child can move about. Um, devices um, often position children high off the ground, so again, um, there are some products out there that I think do a good job maintaining a low foot to floor height. Um, and there's gonna be reasons why you'd still maybe go with that higher um, elevated position for a child. Maybe that they're strictly around adults. Um, maybe it has to do with uh, the amount of growth that is available. And um, so we're moving on to the dynamic standards, which is a favorite. Um, but it's a small percentage of uh, kids that I can, you know, get into the, the dynamic standards typically. You know, two great products are the Rabbit and the, um, the, the Rift and Dynamic Standard. And the benefits are just that, they're, again, like the uh, static standard, it's a smaller size, allows easier transferring. Uh, you have use in different areas, can enable a kid to go outdoors and are in the community uh, to interact with peers. Uh, there's less supports and straps. It's, it's a faster, quicker setup, transfer. Independent mobility often increases tolerance to standing. Um, positioning at peer level leads to increased interaction with the environment. Uh, practice with wheeled mobility, strengthening of upper extremities, trunk and head control. And I'll tell families a lot that when they're wanting to see their child have more success with crawling, that we can enable some strengthening just through wheeled propulsion and again, as stated with um, you know, that multidisciplinary approach, just for children that have behaviors or have limitations with communication, you know, I often tell families that just you know, 
pulling on the wheel a quarter of a turn um, can convey a lot, whether it's forward or, or backwards. If I turn my back, I'm con conveying again that I'm, I'm through with this or I wanna engage you, so. Um, One of Doug's favorite activities when we have our little groups is he'll get kids in, when we have kids standing at circle time, he loves it when they decide to pull on the wheels to pull away from the story that our speech therapist <laughs> is working on. He always likes to point out how much they're communicating to her right then, but. I'm dressed in a suit today, and this is our will, and you know, this is not me as a person. So it's, uh, um, I am passionate about the, the equipment. Uh, the, the, um, I'm passionate with uh, EI and early childhood, and really try to model for families just that element of play and how, and this goes with all equipment, how empowering the equipment is. They're usually coming in heads down and, and not feeling th like their child can do anything. I love getting that parent and knowing, cause I've already assessed this kid as soon as they walked into the door uh, that this is a dynamic standard kind of kid and I can put them in there and within minutes they start moving around uh, the treatment room. And it's so rewarding for those families to just see that level of independence. And that, that just fuels their cognitive development. If they know what's on the other side of the door because now you've enabled that, it's, it's, it's key for these children. So limitations though with the dynamic standards that uh, the child may still need help um, transferring into the device. There's limited positioning supports, there's limited abduction. Uh, wheels can get um, in the way of getting close to surfaces but fortunately most of the time they will uh, remove. And then uh, funding can be challenging to prove medical necessity for dynamic option, they just don't like the wheels for some reason. Uh, but we, we need to continue to fight for that and, and give our kids the access. So moving on to some of the, the fun part of using the standards. Um, looking at um, an article from Iona Novak and Barry, um, I thought this was a really great one about well, how, do you, how do you develop a successful home program? Um, how do you get, get families on, and clients on board to actually um, carry it out? And I think one thing that we have to think about with the evaluation is our evaluation is not just about um, doing the physical assessment, doing that feature comparison, matching the standard to them. That's just the beginning. It is our duty to not just turn over this, this standard to them and make sure they, they have a good fit oh, you look great and out the door. We need to make sure that they know what the goals are, that we're collaborating with the family. They know their child the best and they know their home the best and they know what will work the best. And with us kind of marrying along with that, our knowledge of the equipment and our knowledge of the goals and the, and the physical component, um, we really need to collaborate in order to help them come up with a home program that's realistic and that they can do. Um, figuring out what their goals are, are. I can give a lot of goals and we've talked about what the evidence says in terms of things like bone mineral density and all the benefits that are out there for standing. But is, is improving bone mineral density gonna be a really, really motivating goal for that family? Um, the most motivating goals that I hear are, um, you know, yes, some of the, the physical component and the benefits of standing, but what can they do in a stander? How could this um, affect their long-term outcome? Uh, I think making sure that we're on the same page with goals and the goals are not mine clinically, but that the goals are driven by the family because if they make the goal, they're gonna wanna achieve it. If I give them a goal, I'm not sure how invested they are. So it's, it's a shared process there. Um, the evidence-based intervention, in this case standing, needs to match with the family's goals, and the activities should match the child's preferences and the unique family routine. Regularly checking in with the family um, after the standard is delivered, helping to identify areas that maybe are challenging, opportunities for improvement, making adjustments. What can we do to make sure that beyond that first delivery session and the fit, that this standard is working well in everyday life, that they can function in it? And then reviewing at those regular check-ins the outcomes um, and helping to show them, okay, you know, at our first assessment, we noticed this with your spasticity or we noticed this with your range of motion or head control. Different thing, are there different markers in your physical assessment? Um, could you do a COPM and talk about the objectives that they've gained in terms of function or socialization or doing things at peer level? So in terms of the goals that we're doing, how are they making progress towards those identified goals? And making sure to point that out so that they 
they can realize where there's maybe room to keep working and where we've had successes. Some, some strategies and just kind of tips, I think um, incorporating the standard into a routine that already happens um, is really important. I know um, I have two little ones. I have a four-year-old and a 20-month-old, so my house is busy. But if, so, if I get you know, a bunch of paperwork you know, at pickup from daycare or you know, we have this tomorrow and then, oh, by the way, there's picture day and there's this and there's that and I haven't done laundry, People don't have a lot of time in the evenings, especially for some of these parents that might have multiple medical appointments to go to. They might have you know, multiple other demands on their family. Um, we know that we feel like we have a lot going on, but parents and, and families um, with our clients that have special needs, um, they've, got, they've got a lot of extra demands. So we don't need to add extra homework to their, to their daily routine. We need to think about, instead of giving them home program and saying, here you go, I want you to stand two hours a day when the heck am I gonna find two hours in a busy day already? We need to help them find what they are already doing that we could just tweak. We could just change it and say, instead of when you're cooking dinner, the child doing and being in this position, maybe while you're cooking dinner every night, because that's something that happens every night, that's a time for the stander. I have a child that um, in our group, their mom says, well, they do really well. We know the tube feeds happen a certain number of times during the day and they take a certain amount of time and that's when we do our standing. They, t they tolerate their feeds really well because of the position and they know that they get a certain amount of time because their routine that they've established is just there in the, the standard for the tube feed. Um, another thing to think about, finding a standing buddy. Just like um, with any exercise or diet routine, if you have somebody that's doing it with you and you have some accountability there, um, it, your success rate for carrying it out is gonna be much higher. So I think looking at activities that the, the child or the client can do with somebody who's already doing a similar activity um, will increase the likelihood that it happens. Um, trying things like watching a TV show, going for a walk, um, playing games with their sibling or family and peers, um, all fun ideas. So now I'm, we're gonna show off lots of the cute kiddos that we work with. Um, the families here, they had some great sensory experiences and outdoor experiences that these kids got to partake in. Um, water balloon fight with her brother. Very motivated to be up and standing and be able to get real close to, to get those water balloons at him. Or you know, being able to go outdoors and play in the snow. Um, being able to kind of move around and do things that the other kids were doing at that level. Again, water fights, that sibling rivalry is a real big motivator to be standing sometimes, um, and the air hockey. So I was really blown away when we asked some of our clients, like we told them what we were doing with this presentation, and would you please share with us, how do you, how do you guys make this happen at home? I wanna see outside of the clinic and outside of the things that we show you guys and give ideas for what works for you at home. And they had a lot of great examples. These are some of the examples we were talking about earlier with families that um, have come up with creative ways to make their standard a part of the routine to go for a walk. Um, the little girl on, uh, your, right. yeah. on your right, they've built a handle out of PVC and found a way to clamp it onto the frame so it made it a little bit easier to take that for a walk. Um, their family goes for a walk and bike ride after dinner when it's nice out and it's a really motivating way that they can do something as a family. So we've considered that family dynamic and routine there. Um, and then the other picture, um, this little girl, her brother, figured out some places he could tie a rope on, and man, he could really pull his sister, and they could get going and have some fun. Here's a, another example. Um, this little girl, she um, is cutie, and her family, you see their Great Dane in the background, but they like to go for walks in their neighborhood and, and take the dog for a walk. Um, she had some trouble initially building tolerance to being in a stander, and it was great that her, she got her standard at a time that it was really nice out because they could, she knew that routine and she knew that there was an expectation of a certain amount of time that they do that and it was really motivating for her. So while she didn't want to be in the standard at all inside the house, they gradually built that tolerance by doing outdoor activities and now she's doing a really great job tolerating it and they do a great job of carrying that over. Uh, here's an example, eating, something that happens every day, a routine that happens every day, frequently. For me, I often plan much of my day around eating. But, uh, you know, can they, is, are they a kid that has enough control and that they would be safe eating and swallowing um, in a standing position? So the little girl um, in the wheeled stander over there, um, they, put her, they give her snack time so she can chase around her sisters while they're running around the house having a snack. 
Um, the other little girl, she was one I was talking about where family does her, their tube feeds in her stander. Um, she tolerates it well, she has less reflux issues, and they just know that that's something that has to happen every day, and so I know every day I'm gonna get that right amount of standing in. This one, um, cooking, you can see in the background, they, you know, one, one of the times of the day that they're giving her a tube feed is while they're also cooking dinner for themselves. So she's part of the family routine, she's in the kitchen, dad's back there cooking, they have her, her communication device set up so she can talk and be part of what's going on, she can ask to take a turn with stirring or cutting or whatever they're doing, so it's a great example of, of how well this is integrated into the family routine. And I think, uh, so one, one story they shared with Doug, you can go ahead. Oh, <clears throat> just with the uh, next slide here. No, um, so when she's in her stander, she frequently uses her communication device um, and says, Alexa, play songs from Moana. So, you know, she, their family is always um, battling over what's the playlist while the cooking is happening, and she makes sure that she gets, gets her say in that. So. Um, this Football. one is fun. She uh, was in her stander for the Super Bowl with Dad. Mom was out of town, and she shared the story with us that, you know, Dad um, sends pictures to prove that he really is doing all the things he's supposed to be doing while Mom's out of town. Um, but one of the things that happened while mom was out of town was the Super Bowl, and they shared a great video and story of her. Um, she was watching football with dad and had her Toby up, and she kept saying, change the channel. I want to watch Moana. This is boring. So she was giving her opinion. She was being participatory in, in the family routine there, and they had to say, no, the Super Bowl really is fun. We are going to watch that. <laughs> so. Um, these were some other examples of using standing and routines. So um, in school and peer groups, this was a great application at school. There was some little, you know, presentation or assembly or, you know, like performance where they had song and, and stuff. And this little kiddo, they made sure they had him in his stander while they were doing that. So he was at the same level with his peers and right up there in the mix. Um, the, the playground example. Playground might be a really great way of um, getting the kids up and standing. So everybody's running around and being crazy there. That's a great time to be at peer level. In here, um, standing during story time or bubbles, just making sure the activities are fun and motivating and it's something that is a preference for the, the client. Story time or using the talker. So I actually have a, a, a fair number of clients, especially with some of the eye gaze and, and head, um, head pointing controls on their communication devices that they're maybe more alert or more um, accurate and more engaged um, in using their communication device when they are standing. So I have some good success with that. If they're well supported and we set it, the stander upright for that, um, that can be a great opportunity. Here we have a few cute examples. Um, we get, do a lot of ball play activities in our therapy groups that we have. So um, suspending a beach ball from the ceiling and getting that right there, we have kids hitting the beach ball back and forth. Or um, if they have um, good upper extremity skills and can play a game of catch, that's a really great um, time to be standing. We um, recently had some success there. Here's one of the, the benefits of the adjustable tray. If you adjust that tray so the angle is um, pointing down, it can be a great ramp to do some good bowling. And just increase an, inc an opportunity to increase volitional control for this young girl too. So she um, has difficulty functionally using her upper extremities, but we could position the ball and then work on her releasing the ball so that uh, they, she could bowl. And you know, our model is in a kind of group environment. And so it was nice to where we can work on taking turns and just um, get excited for, for everybody's little bit of uh, success. Yeah. That particular day, I think, was one of the days that she had, um, you know, dad was there and she had had some trouble uh, tolerating a few of the other activities that we were doing. And we got in the stander and we weren't sure how it was going to go that day because she wasn't in the greatest mood for every activity. But man, it turned out to be great. She was able to be around all the peers. We got that angle down. Even though she really um, has to work hard to use her arms, she we could get her arm, we could sit on top of that ball, and just working on a little movement to you know, slide her arm off the ball, she could let it roll down and go bowling, and it was a lot of fun. Everybody was laughing. Here's some more cute kiddos playing music, um, playing blocks, finding those motivators. 
Uh, like I said earlier, I work with a lot of kids that have cortical visual impairment. So um, thinking about how vision also might impact your posture. Um, if you don't, if it's hard to see some of the things that you want to interact with because of a visual impairment, that really might affect posture and positioning in a stander as well as any other positioning device. But if we get uh, the right kind of activity set up for them in their stander, then that might really improve posture and alignment um, in there. As well so. as tolerance. As well as tolerance, for sure. So, you know, standing, if we don't have the right motivator, you're not gonna get the dosage that you want. So with this, this mom found this really great. It's a little, it's just commercial O-ball activity arc that you think about for really little kids, but this worked great to clip it onto the tray. And then we could hang some, uh, some um, other toys that were more at eye level where visually she functions the best. Her tolerance really improved when she had something that she could see and she could do a little bit easier. And like I said, here are a few more um, activities that where we included some visual modifications and that really helped to increase their engagement and their tolerance and participation. So they were able to get the dosage we wanted when we included the visual supports there. Light box, shiny things, ball play, things at eye level. Um, dramatic play. Um, how motivating is that for kids? So we were playing dress up and uh, you know, we had some, yeah, the, the eyebrows were Doug. That's his very serious self at work. Um, but he's, he's a great crafter and, and all things dramatic play and dress up is kind of his, his niche, I think. Um, but, you know, we have uh, some fun, fun props. The kids had a ball with that and they tolerated standing really well because we were having a lot of fun. Um, kitchen play. That's another one of those that like when I talked about, can you get up to the activities you wanna do and thinking about the frame size and the setup, um, we have a lot of fun with that. And then um, at our center, one of our favorite activities every year is we take the kids in our therapy groups trick or treating. Um, and I would say a majority of our kids are either in power chairs or standers or something along that line when we go um, trick or treating and around the hospital and they just have a ball. So we've had anything from Cinderella to, um, from Monsters, Inc., the little girl from that. Um, and then this was a cute one of our whole group this year. Um, all, all dressed up and ready to go trick-or-treating. And man, they were really motivated to stay in their standards for a long time while they were getting candy. So... Um, so that's it. Uh, we've got a lot of resources here. So if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to stand up and shout them out. Thank you.